Just so we're all clear on this, the exam is on Friday, December 21st at 9 a.m., and it's in Sieges South, uh, SO10. I'm glad I checked. I thought it was going to be in this room. That's the way we do at the University of Virginia, but I looked it up. And so anyway, uh, that's where we'll be. And I'll remind you, according to the Mayan calendar, the world ends on December 21st. Uh, Harvard says if the world ends, you still have only 24 hours to finish the exam. Uh, so so we'll, we'll get through it somehow. Uh, and uh, uh, if anyone wanted a hard copy of the final exam format, I've got some here. Otherwise, you all have it. Uh, and let me stress that these samples are genuine samples. Uh, the IDs will not be arcane or designed to trick you. They will be substantial passages that you should be able to recognize. And similarly, the questions will be uh, directed towards what the course has been about. Uh, they're not going to be trick questions. Uh, I'm pitching them right down the middle of the plate. Swing away, don't bunt. Uh, so, and then we'll have time to talk about the exam. I'm not going to spend the whole time uh, uh, lecturing. Uh, while, uh, uh, as we're coming to a close here, uh, uh, I should be correcting all the historical errors I've made over the semester. But one thing I have to I mentioned that the, the English executed Charles II last time. It was Charles I they executed. James I, Charles I, Charles II, James II. And they would have executed James III, but he didn't get to the throne. But anyway, so Charles I. And also, I discovered recently in proofreading a book review that I misspelled Lord Burley's name. Uh, that's how it's correctly spelled. I was spelling it L-E-I-G-H. Not that that's all that important. Uh, we have six or seven authentic signatures from Shakespeare, and I believe he spells his name differently each time. The Elizabethans didn't have dictionaries, and they weren't big on spelling. Which reminds me that my Libyan cab driver in New York asked me to tell you uh, that Gaddafi uh, uh, pronounced the name of our author, William Shock's Beard, uh, and claimed that he was an Arab. Anyway, the cab driver thought this was going to crack you guys up, but <laughs> that's why he's a cab driver in New York uh, <laughs> instead of being a former minister of defense, no doubt. Uh, anyway, uh, that was my main profit from going to New York uh, uh, this week. Uh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> as we're coming to a close here, uh, two acknowledgments I do want to make. Bill County has been my roadie here, my techie, and has done a great job uh, recording this. We do hope that this will be made available online eventually on the Comedy Channel or uh, the Two Network or uh, Adult Swim, no doubt. Uh, but anyway, as you know, he's also helped me help my voice get through the semester. Uh, Fortuitously, Professor Harvey Mansfield's not here today, uh, so I can thank him. Just do understand, he was the one who uh, raised the money for bringing me here through his program on constitutional government. Uh, he blushes so terribly that I could not have said this if he were here. Uh, so anyway, and, he, and, and Andrew Zwick uh, very much helped raise the money, and I highly recommend the program on constitutional government. It brings all sorts of interesting speakers uh, to Harvard, even me. Uh, so, again, I, I would be very remiss. At least we've recorded that for the television camera, and now he won't even know I said it. All right. Uh, what I hope to do now is speak for about a half hour, 40 minutes, uh, winding up uh, uh, on Macbeth, uh, and then uh, you can ask me questions about the final or any questions you have about the course or about Shakespeare. Uh, I've been offering you Macbeth as Shakespeare's portrait of the tyrant. And I want to examine that a little more fully uh, uh, today. We've considered various forms of government in Shakespeare. Uh, aristocratic republic, commercial republic, uh, monarchy. Uh, tyranny is a form of government. Uh, and Shakespeare apparently doesn't like it. Uh, he gives very negative portraits of tyranny. His first extensive portrait of tyranny really is in uh, the play Richard III, uh, but Macbeth is his greatest portrait uh, of a tyrant. I should say that this Greek word tyrannos, from which we derive our word tyranny, was originally a more neutral word. Uh, tyrannos 
simply referred uh, to how you got to power. And someone who was not born to the throne, uh, but got there by his own efforts, which often involved killing the current occupant of the throne, was called a tyrannos. Uh, and there was, in fact, an age of tyrants in Athens in the 6th century. Uh, and at first, people thought tyranny uh, was a great new form of government. Uh, because along the lines of Machiavelli's argument for illegitimate princes, uh, the tyrannoi, uh, that's the Greek plural for tyrant, uh, the, the, the tyrants uh, were often very accomplished rulers. Uh, they did great things for their city. Uh, because they needed to shore up their rule. So, for example, Pisistratus, the great 6th century BC tyrant in uh, uh, Athens, he may very well be the one who created the Athenian theater, theater. He may very well be the one who first had the Homeric poems written down. He established a lot of great institutions uh, in Athens. Uh, 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 many of these tyrants were very effective rulers. Again, the point being they couldn't rest on their laurels. Uh, they'd had to fight to get to the throne. Uh, they were very energetic rulers. However, after a while, people began to notice that tyrants behaved tyrannically. Uh, uh, that, for example, they surrounded themselves with bodyguards. That they were feeling insecure and executed their opponents. Uh, and gradually, the word tyrant came to take on its modern negative uh, uh, connotations. And a lot of the most interesting political writings of the ancient Greek world are about tyranny. Uh, Xenophon's dialogue, The Hero, uh, which is a, a dialogue about whether it's good to be a tyrant or not. And of course, Plato's Republic, um, as I suggested, one of the potential paper topics, has a very interesting section in books eight and nine on the tyrant. Uh, you have to understand that initially, tyranny seemed like a viable option. I mean, in the 6th century, a mother in Athens could say, gee, I really hope my little boy grows up to be a tyrant. Uh, uh, but uh, as they gradually be people began to realize the defects of this form of government, and it's very much what Shakespeare portrays uh, uh, in Macbeth, uh, that the tyrant, uh, by destroying the very principle of legitimacy, becomes radically insecure as a ruler. And so we see Macbeth getting involved in increasing murders, uh, becoming the bloody butcher that uh, people t uh, come to take him for. And indeed, it's, uh, uh, it's a very interesting story in this sense that uh, Macbeth seems initially to be a decent man, both in the sense that he's admired in the community and admired for his military prowess, and that we see he has very strong compunctions initially about killing Duncan, so much so that he almost doesn't do it. What we see in the course of the play is tyranny producing the tyrant, uh, another way in which a form of government shapes character, that Macbeth becomes the worse for having chosen the path of tyranny. And we see him getting nastier and nastier. So by the end of the play, he's almost uh, unrecognizable. Uh, but what I'd like to uh, focus on, and, and this is going to be very speculative uh, today, is the question of Macbeth, uh, what makes him distinctive uh, as a tyrant. Uh, and I want to suggest uh, that somehow he is a kind of uh, a modern tyrant uh, and, and not an ancient tyrant, and the worse for it. Uh, he seems so unusually bloody as a tyrant. Now, in the ancient world, again, tyranny was a, <laughs> a fairly common uh, political form. Uh, the tyrant uh, was always thought of uh, as a man who ruled in his own interests, who essentially seizes the throne uh, and then uh, essentially uh, perverts it to his own purposes. And that chiefly meant, uh, in uh, uh, ancient terms, uh, that the tyrant used uh, his tyranny to indulge his desires. And we have an echo of that in um, uh, Macduff's comment, boundless intemperance and in nature is a tyranny, and the whole dialogue with Malcolm in which the emphasis is on the tyrant's avarice uh, and his luxuriousness. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, the ancient tyrants uh, were thought of as self-indulgent. This is very clear again in this dialogue by, I should get Xenophon's name on the board, Xenophon's uh, 
hero, which is all about uh, especially the tyrant's uh, impulse to indulge his sexual desires. And we can use Antony and Cleopatra as our example of that in this course. Uh, uh, tyranny comes up in the Roman plays. Remember the plebeians accuse Coriolanus of wanting to be a tyrant. Of course, the whole issue in Julius Caesar is whether Julius Caesar is a tyrant. But really in Antony and Cleopatra, we see tyranny. Uh, the regime of Antony and Cleopatra is post-legitimate. It occurs after the dissolution of the Republic. Uh, uh, Octavius is in the process of shaping a new legitimate regime, which will be the empire. But in the interim, uh, essentially, we have a kind of tyranny. And we see this above all in the way Antony and Cleopatra uh, treat and abuse messengers. Very beating the messenger. It's a very characteristic gesture uh, of the tyrant. Uh, uh, they rule in their own name. Uh, uh, they rule in the name of themselves as gods. Uh, and of course, the core of their regime is self-indulgence. Uh, and they establish themselves as uh, 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 the uh, greatest lovers in the world and expect everybody to admire them and look up to them. Uh, for that reason. And I, I offer that so you have some sense of what the ancient understanding of tyranny was. Now what's odd about Macbeth is he never enjoys his tyranny. Uh, uh, Malcolm accuses him of luxuriousness and avarice in Act 4, but I don't see any signs of that in the play. Uh, that is, uh, for example, the tyrant is notorious for raping women. Uh, we don't see that. Uh, uh, Tarquin was required, uh, uh, Tarquinius Superbius was a, uh, the Roman image of a tyrant because he raped the Roman maiden, Lucretia. Uh, but uh, Macbeth talks about Tarquin's ravishing strides, but he doesn't ravish anybody. Uh, uh, and indeed, almost the saddest thing about him is that he never gets to enjoy uh, uh, this tyranny. Uh, and that's the, uh, that puzzles me, uh, uh, and I've been trying to think that through, uh, and in particular what we see about Macbeth is that in his case, the tyrant's concern for security becomes all-consuming. All he thinks about uh, is uh, uh, securing his rule, and that chiefly means killing off anybody uh, who becomes uh, a possible threat to his rule. Uh, in that, it seems to me, he resembles modern tyrants more. Uh, now, again, the ancient tyrants were murderers. We see at the beginning of Act 4 of Julius Caesar that the uh, triumvirate is, is executing their political enemies. Still, they have a list. Uh, it's a finite list. It runs into the hundreds and not the millions. Uh, and they're executing for them for political reasons. They don't, for example, kill women and children. Macbeth does. Uh, there's an unusual cruelty to his tyranny, uh, which leads me to think that Shakespeare is being uh, uh, unusually prescient in this play in predicting what the nature of modern tyranny would be like. And I mentioned Hitler and Stalin last time, uh, and I'd li like to say a little bit more about them and the nature uh, of modern tyranny. And this is going to sound paradoxical, but this is a very paradoxical uh, play. Uh, uh, in Henry V, and you can look it up, it's on page 17 of your editions, um, Henry says in the first act, we are no tyrant but a Christian king. But Macbeth is a Christian tyrant. Uh, and that's the odd thing here. Henry acts as if there's a distinction, you know, Christian kings can't be tyrants. Uh, yet what happens when one of these Christians becomes a tyrant? And this is uh, uh, what's so striking about Macbeth that I've been arguing here, that, that, that uh, he is torn between uh, his status as a pagan warrior and his Christianity, uh, part of him uh, despises people who are gospeled and wants to be a heroic pagan warrior, uh, but part of him is deeply involved in his conscience and he's worried about salvation and damnation. 
As I've been suggesting, the hope of the Renaissance was to create this very positive synthesis of Christianity and classical values. Uh, uh, yet what I'm saying Shakespeare explores in his tragedies uh, is the strange perversions that occur when these two great currents in our civilization come together uh, and distort each other. If Macbeth were simply a pagan warrior, there'd be no tragedy. Uh, he maybe wouldn't have killed Duncan. If he did, he could have lived with it the way pagan warriors tend to do. Uh, if he were simply Christian, uh, he wouldn't have killed Duncan. What is so odd about Macbeth is expressed by Lady Macbeth, a soldier and a feared. He is a kind of Achilles with a conscience. He's a pagan warrior who nevertheless uh, has had his horizons transformed by Christianity. Uh, and in particular, that has made him obsessed with eternity in a way that an Achilles or a Coriolanus uh, simply uh, never was. So that, uh, for example, on page 42, we've looked at this before, but let's look at it again. Uh, uh, his concern about Banquo is a concern with eternity. This is Act 3, Scene 1, about little line 65. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind, for them the gracious Duncan have I murdered, put rankers in the vessel of my peace, only for them and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man. So on the one hand, he's very concerned that his eternal soul is at stake. Uh, and moreover, his whole obsession with Banquo is that Banquo wins the battle for eternity. That Macbeth is going to be king, but the witches have promised that Banquo will be, will be the founder of a line of kings. Uh, still on that page 42, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown. Uh, 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 on page 47, uh, Lady Macbeth's consolation to Banquo, uh, uh, excuse me to fellow, excuse me to Macbeth, <laughs> that's all running together in one mind. Page 47, Act 3, Scene 2, about line 39, uh, when Macbeth expresses his concern about Banquo and Fleance, uh, Lady Macbeth says, Macbeth says, but in them, nature's copy is not eternal. Sense of the play, nature is not eternal. But this play opens up vistas on something beyond nature, supernature, the supernatural that is eternal. And that's what they're uh, questing for. So that, again, to return to page 65... Act 4, scene 1, line 117, when Macbeth has the vision among the witches of Banquo's succession, what he says is, what will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? And that's his great fear, that Banquo inherits eternity. He inherits the supernatural. Macbeth is somehow confined to this natural world. And um, uh, his tyranny is so much the greater for this reason. Uh, it is that desire for the absolute, for the infinite, for perfection. To be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. Uh, and here, and this is a very tentative thought, but I, uh, let me express it uh, anyway, uh, that for the ancient tyrants, they modeled themselves on the ancient gods. Uh, and that means on the uh, uh, pagan gods, uh, in a way, you could say what the ancient tyrant wanted to be was Zeus. Uh, and this is the way it was actually understood in the ancient world, that the ancient tyrant wanted to be a god. And Zeus is a pretty impressive character, and above all, he can have everything he desires, and especially can indulge his sexual desires. And you can really see how these ancient tyrants uh, tried to act out uh, the life of pagan gods. Uh, this is going to sound very weird, but I hinted at it last time that uh, Macbeth's notion of being a tyrant uh, is to be the god of Christianity. Uh, and that means an omnipotent and omniscient god, something much more. Uh, uh, you see this, again, I read these last time, but uh, you can see it uh, uh, on page 56. Uh, 
uh, Act 3, Scene 4, towards the end, line 140. Strange things I have in head that will to hand, which must be acted ere they may be scanned. Uh, uh, <laughs> what Macbeth likes is, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. That is, this is the kind of being who uh, uh, just has to think something, uh, and it happens. This is even stronger on page 66, uh, where uh, he says, uh, 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 this is Act 4, Scene 1, about 46. From this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. And even now, to crown my thought with acts, be it thought and done. This is omnipotence. This is, you just have to think it and it happens. As for omniscience, that's back on page 56 again, end of Act 3, Scene 4, uh, top of 56. There's not a one of them, but in his house I keep a servant feed. He has his spy network all throughout Scotland. So he's all-seeing uh, and all-powerful. Uh, now, again, I offer this tentatively, but it does... Uh, suggested this is you know the per, the perversion of the best becomes the worst. Uh, one would you know the great hope is that Christianity might moderate the fierceness of these pagan heroes, but it only increases Macbeth's cruelty uh, uh, because he now thinks perfections uh, at, at stake. Uh, remember his reaction uh, to uh, the news that. Uh, 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 Fleance uh, had escaped. Uh, I had else been perfect. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, that's page 51. Uh, uh, Act 3, scene 4, line 22. I had else been perfect. Whole as the marble found of this rock, as broad and general as the casing air. It's another indication that his notion is to become a kind of omnipotent god. Founded as the rock, as broad and general as the casing, whole as the marble. Uh, this again is that all or nothing attitude I've been pointing at uh, uh, since Hamlet, that you now have a conception of the infinite and the absolute, and that if you can't achieve that, uh, you have nothing. Uh, uh, and in his quest for absolute certainty and absolute security, Macbeth becomes a crueler tyrant than anything you observe uh, in the ancient world. Uh, and it did strike me that, that in this sense, Shakespeare uh, may be incredibly prophetic here uh, in seeing what the nature of tyranny uh, would be in the modern world. Uh, I'm going to say that, that Macbeth's tyranny is a kind of ascetic tyranny. Uh, not aesthetic, but ascetic. Uh, that is, again, he's not in it for the enjoyment. Uh, indeed, it becomes sort of an endless process now of just trying to secure the throne, and he doesn't indulge his desires. And uh, it, it strikes me when you when you think of the possibly the two most important modern tyrants, uh, Hitler and Stalin. Uh, they uh, they both were remarkably ascetic. Uh, we don't talk about them indulging in huge orgies and parties the way we do with Latin American and African tyrants and all sorts of other modern tyrants. <laughs> Stalin <laughs> studied to be a priest. Hitler studied to be a painter. Uh, uh, and they were in it for the kind of pure tyranny. Uh, and they show the kind of same obsession with security, the endless concern with security that we see and Macbeth. It's kind of ironic that uh, the great Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich wrote an opera, Lady Macbeth of Matensk, which is an uh, uh, opera created out of a 19th century uh, Russian story that transposed the Macbeth story to, the, to Russia. Uh, and Stalin hated the opera. <laughs> In fact, his negative review of it uh, almost ended Shostakovich's life. But it's kind of interesting that Stalin had to sit there and watch a representation of the best story, and it didn't please Papa Joe. Uh, uh, now, here's, here's the connection I see. Uh, a number of people uh, have argued that both communism uh, and Nazism are secularizations 
<laughs> of Christianity and especially, especially Christian millenarianism. Uh, that is, uh, that what these modern tyrannies have in common is, for one thing, they present themselves as inevitable, as the inevitable outcome of history. Both Marxism and Nazism have theories of history uh, in which history leads up to Stalin, history leads up to Hitler. Uh, in the case of Stalin, you have the Marxist dialectic of history that makes the triumph of communism inevitable, not just likely, not just probable, but inevitable. Uh, Hitler famously came up with the Third Reich theory, which is based on medieval notions of the millennium and uh, the third kingdom uh, uh, fulfilling human destiny. Uh, the other aspect that both Nazism and communism have in mind is that they are offer heaven on earth. They are secularizations of the idea of heaven, uh, that we can have heaven on earth, that through this political transformation, whether it's communist or Nazi, we can create a perfect world and a new man and a new woman. Very strong elements both in uh, Soviet Union and in Nazi Germany. Uh, this is Macbeth's, uh, 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 if it could be done when it is done, well it could be done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequences and catch with this success. But here, uh, 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 that this act might be the be all and the end all here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. That is a secularization of the absolute. That's saying we can have the be-all and the end-all, but here, upon this bank and show of time. Now, I, I attribute semi-mystical prophetic powers to Shakespeare. This may be too much on my part, but, but, but I, I think he divines something here, uh, that a new kind of tyranny might emerge in the modern world based upon the idea uh, of somehow the inevitability of history, history marching towards a goal that will be a form of heaven on earth, and th this would now be the most savage form uh, of, of, of tyranny. Uh, uh, and again, I, I offer this very tentatively because it's claiming a lot for Shakespeare, but, but the, uh, uh, the most frightening aspect of Macbeth's tyranny is that humanity itself becomes its enemy. Uh, it becomes almost the willful destruction of other human beings. Now again, the ancient tyrants, they wanted other human beings. They enjoyed their honors. They enjoyed the sexual relations. They killed off enemies, but they weren't trying to extirpate the whole population. What's of course so frightening about 20th century tyranny uh, is all these acts of genocide, mass exterminations, as if the very goal of the state uh, were to eliminate humanity. And you see it in Macbeth in the desire uh, to exterminate the very power of germination. Spill nature's Germans. Uh, and again, that's not G-E-R-M-A-N-S. Uh, uh, but it is uh, his great... Uh, uh, notion that I, I want to wipe out generation and we see it in his wife's uh, impulse to kill her own children. Anyway, I just, there's something unnatural about Macbeth's tyranny. It seems to be directed against nature itself uh, as if nature is now the enemy because nature sets limits to human desire and sets limits to the tyrant, tyrant's desire. Anyway, I just, I, I sense these connections uh, with the, uh, 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 the phenomenon of tyranny in the uh, 20th century. Uh, now, in particular, what you see in Macbeth is a supernatural justification for his tyranny. Uh, and again, let's not forget that he is set off by these witches making a prophecy that he will be Thane of Quarter and that he will be uh, uh, then king. Uh, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, there would be nothing here without page 12. Uh, uh, this is Act 1, Scene 3, uh, when Macbeth says, this supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. 
we could take this as our motto in the course since Hamlet, that this supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. It seems so good, but it turns out to be so ill. Uh, and, and Lady Macbeth on the bottom of page 16, uh, uh, this is Act 1, Scene 5, about line 30, speaks of all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid does seem to have the crown with all. It's amazing. Shakespeare thinks of metaphysical aid here. Uh, and again, uh, metaphysics is a very fancy philosophical word. Now all it means in Greek is it was, Aristotle wrote a book called The Physics, and then he wrote a book after it, which was Metaphysica, uh, uh, and that deals with the kind of philosophical questions we now call metaphysics after that book. There's a very literal meaning, in, I mean, in Greece, in Greek, Meta, uh, metaphysica is after physics, after the study of natural things. But still, the talk of supernatural soliciting uh, and metaphysical aid uh, in this work uh, it points to uh, this strange distortion uh, of the world. I, I can't even take you through all the times the word unnatural appears in this play. Uh, uh, this obsession with the supernatural and metaphysical aid generates all these unnatural things in the play. Uh, and it does seem to be the tragedy of Macbeth that he's drawn in to this belief that anything he does is justified by some sense of providence. Uh, that he can kill anybody uh, because it's what the universe is willing. Now again, that's an eerie premonition of what men like Hitler and Stalin uh, uh, would become like. Uh, and uh, uh, Shakespeare treats this theme at great length in the play. Uh, if you turn to page 63, so it's Act 4, Scene 1, uh, about line 75, this is the scene uh, with the witches uh, where Macbeth uh, 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 is introduced to these sites and first he is w warned against Macduff. Uh, uh, and then he's given the prophecy, line 80, uh, be bloody bold and resolute, laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Which to him is very reassuring because he believes that all are born of women. Uh, and so how uh, can he ever be harmed? And then the uh, third apparition, uh, is Macbeth, this is on page 64, line 92, Macbeth shall never vanquish be until great Burnham Wood to hide Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. Uh, and here it's quite explicit uh, that Macbeth's supernatural confidence rests on a kind of uh, buried belief in the constancy of nature. This is page 64, line 95. Who can impress the forest Bid the tree unfix his earthbound root. Sweet Bodeman's good, rebellious, dead, rise never. Again, his, uh, his hostility to the possibility of resurrection. Till the wood of Burnham rise, and our high place Macbeth shall live the lease of nature. Uh, uh, Macbeth says this can't happen. In the course of nature, forests don't move. Therefore, I am safe. And similarly, his notion, you know, all men are born of women. Uh, therefore, if I don't have to fear a man born of woman, I don't have to fear any man. Uh, now, it is interesting that the sights correspond the sounds here. Uh, Macbeth is very much relying on what he hears. Back on page 63, line 78, he says, Had I three ears, I'd hear thee. But notice the second apparition is a bloody child. These are riddles, and the sights solve the riddle. Uh, as we learn, Macduff was born by Caesarean section. Uh, in that technical sense, he was not born of woman. He did not, not emerge naturally from the womb. Uh, Roman Polanski, in his uh, very lurid version, film version, uh, shows a scene of a Caesarean section at this point. First time I realized what was going on here. Because notice the third apparition is a child crowned with a tree in his hand, which again tips the the solution to the riddle to Macbeth there. Uh, uh, so uh, these sound like supernatural happenings, a man not born of woman, a forest moving. But it turns out they're perfectly natural events. 
somewhat out of the ordinary, but, but uh, nothing mysterious about them, a caesarean section, uh, and carrying a branch from a tree. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, this is the way Macbeth finally resolves uh, the problem, page 95, uh, and when he understands this, uh, so Act 5, Scene 8, Line 19, and be these juggling fiends no more believed that palter with us in a double sense that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. Uh, here he understands that he heard what he wanted to hear. He heard the prophecies. He did not look. If he had looked and relied on what he saw with his own eyes, he would have seen the solutions to the riddles. Now, it's very interesting that on page 26, uh, <clears throat> Macbeth, uh, warned by that vision of a dagger, says, this is Act 2, Scene 1, about line 44, mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. A very interesting choice presented in the play. Uh, what you see with your own eyes and largely what you hear. Now, in this, uh, in this context, uh, there's an interesting passage in the New Testament, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, so faith comes from what is heard. <laughs> Indeed, we see the best case is faith comes from what he hears, not from what he sees. And if he be guided by what he saw, especially in the apparition scene, he might well have been saved uh, uh, here. Uh, so again, it's a, this is a play that very much problematizes revelation in the way that Hamlet does, the whole issue of the true status of what the ghost presents. And then uh, the whole story of Iago and Othello, where Othello comes to see and hear through Iago where again a whole scene takes place which between uh, Cassio and Bianca, which we know to be innocent uh, and which Othello uh, misinterprets because he lets uh, I Iago uh, in effect uh, uh, narrate it all to him. Uh, so again, it's one of the ways in which this play fits into this overall critique in Shakespeare, the, the impact of, of re revelation on politics. Again, this sense here that um, the Beth is distorted into the cruelest form of tyranny uh, by his uh, sense that a whole supernatural force lies behind what he's doing. Okay, I'm almost done for today. I'm now going to try to sum up the whole course uh, uh, with one um, uh, thematic pattern in Macbeth, and that's the treatment of the word man. Uh, and the treatment of manliness uh, in the play. Here I'm drawing very heavily on an essay by Jose Benedetti. It's called Macbeth's Last Words. It was in the first volume of a journal called Interpretation. There's a citation. But if you just Google Jose Benedetti Macbeth, the, the whole issue comes up and it's pages 63 to 76. It's one of the best essays written on Macbeth. Uh, uh, and I won't, I'll, I'll just steal from the essay as I go along. I won't try to present it in Benedetti's uh, words. Uh, but in a way, the whole debate we've been looking at this semester in Shakespeare between the ancient pagan world and the modern Christian world, between what Nietzsche calls mass morality and slave morality, and, and Benedetti introduces the terms master and slave morality uh, in, in this essay, uh, it's all summed up in the debate of what it is to be a man in this play. Uh, if you turn to page 22, so this is Act 1, uh, Scene uh, 7, the uh, argument between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth over whether to kill Duncan. Uh, uh, and she's accusing him of lacking valor. Remember, we began this course with Coriolanus and Valor's the chiefest virtue. Uh, uh, this is line 39. Art thou afeard to be the same thing and I don't act in valor as thou art in desire? Uh, wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life and live a coward in thine own esteem? 
This is the greatest challenge a warrior can have to his honor. To be called a coward, and especially to be called a coward by a woman and his wife. Uh, this is Lady Macbeth's very deliberate attempt to shame this noble warrior uh, into doing the deed. Macbeth says, Pretty peace, I dare do all that may become a man who dares do more is not. And this opens up the question that the whole play deals with is what is a man? Uh, and the question is, uh, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me when you just do it, then you were a man? Uh, and uh, Lady Macbeth challenges him with the ancient notion of manliness, that manliness is valor, it's courage. Now, uh, I started... Uh, uh, my whole discussion, Macbeth, with page 43, uh, uh, which also bears on this issue of what is a man. Remember, this is when Macbeth challenges the murderers. Act 3, scene 1, about line 88. Are you so gospeled to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? We are men, my liege. And in context, what that means is we are men, not Christians. Uh, real men are not Christians. The gospel sit back and take it. They don't stand up for themselves. Uh, and Macbeth goes on to say, you know, to question the definition of man here. Is man a term of distinction? I in the catalog you go for men as hounds and gray irons, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shuffs, water rugs, and demi wolves are clept all by the name of dogs. The valued file distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, every one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, where he but doth receive particular addition from the bill that writes them all alike, and so of men. Now, if you have a station in the file, not in the worst rank of manhood. It's a very aristocratic understanding here. There are different kinds of men, and real men are valiant and full of valor. They're manly, they're warriors, uh, they fight for their rights, they don't uh, sit back and take it uh, from uh, 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 other men. Uh, this is a distinction that uh, goes back to ancient Greek. I forget if I talked about this before, but if I did, you can always repeat yourself in the last lecture. Uh, in ancient, in, in Homeric Greek, uh, uh, there are two terms uh, for man, one anair and one anthropos. Uh, anair is the word for a male human being. And anthropos is the word for human being. I mean, this is, uh, the word man is ambiguous in English. It can either mean a male or it can mean humanity. And indeed, we've uh, been warned not to use the word man to refer, we're supposed to talk about humankind, not mankind, and so on. But this is, uh, 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 in many languages, the word for uh, a male is the same as the word for the generic human being. In Greek, no. Uh, and the Homeric heroes, uh, they call each other anair. And the sense of anair is of a he-man. That's the best way to understand it. These heroes, Achilles, Ajax, Odysseus, they're, they're all uh, Andres. That's the Greek plural. Uh, each one's an Anair. In a sense, he's a he-man. Uh, in modern languages, <laughs> the best translation of Anair would be into Spanish, hombre. Uh, in no other language that I know does it have quite the force of Greek Anair. When you say hombre, you know what you mean. That's because an hombre has cojones. Uh, if you really want to know what I mean. Uh, 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 and again, it works in other languages, but if you really want to understand the force uh, that on air, and the heroes step up to each other and they call each other on air. I mean, the way athletes now say man. And I might add female athletes say man. Uh, but anyway, hombre on air, it's the word for the hero, and it's a very aristocratic term. Uh, the ordinary human beings, they're just anthropoi. That's the plural of anthropos. They're just ordinary human beings. Uh, this is very strong in the Iliad. It's often presented as the difference between two species. Uh, 
uh, the difference between uh, a lion and a, uh, a lamb. Uh, the hero is the, the, the aner is a lion, the ordinary anthropos uh, is, is a lamb. And we saw that in Coriolanus. A very strong sense of this in Coriolanus. This is, the, this is mass morality. It's the ancient aristocratic understanding of humanity. Now, again, even within the Greek world, uh, they move beyond this. Uh, the great thrust of Greek philosophy is to take the Anthropos point of view. But already in the Odyssey, there are many ways in which Odysseus is more the Anthropos than the Anair. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, this is the view that's classically embodied in the uh, Iliad. Uh, but uh, you know, even within the ancient Greek world, uh, they were moving beyond this to the sense that the Anair isn't everything. Uh, that there's an anthropos side to human beings uh, that may make them better. And so Odysseus is not just uh, a heroic butcher, although he is that, but he cares about his wife and his family, and he's clever, he's smarter than Achilles. There are all these things he has. He's attached to a, a female goddess, Athena, and so on. So what I'm saying is we see that sense of two meanings of man emerge back in that dialogue I started with, uh, with Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Uh, when Macbeth says, this is back on page 22, pretty peace, I dare do all that may become a man, he's talking anthropos here. Uh, uh, I dare do all that may become a human being. A human being has certain moral limits. Who dares do more is none. It's a sense here, and on air, uh, a he-man, an hombre, uh, he's too much in the grip of Thumas, remember that, from Coriolanus, and will do these savage things. Uh, <laughs> Lady Macbeth seems to understand, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man, then you were an honor, then you were an hombre, then you had cojones, you don't now. Uh, see what the debate is, and to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. The question is, what is a man? Is it a human being who has perhaps some compassion, who has some moral compunctions, or is a human uh, is a man just an hombre, the kind of guy we saw in the opening scene who cut someone in half and was praised for it? Uh, and you see the consequences of Lady Macbeth's radical, on-air view uh, of man. Uh, line 54, I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, <coughs> have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have done to this. And it's very interesting in her obsessive attachment to the, um, you know, the on-air or ombre view of man. She denies her own womanliness to the point, uh, you know, saying the unimaginable thing here, a woman who would destroy her own child. Uh, and then <laughs> Macbeth says, if we should fail, we fail but screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. Everything here is Homeric. Everything is like the Roman Republic. It's everything hinges on valor and courage. And this leads Macbeth to say, bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Pretty frightening aspect, a woman who is so full of the Anair principle that she can only have men, children. Now again, when I, when I mention this uh, of the ancient Greeks, their emphasis on the he-man, it may sound sexist to you, and in a way it is. But it is fascinating that in Greek tragedy, the Greeks use the word on air of women. And there are two extraordinary examples of when it happens. One is an Antigone, uh, when Creon complains at uh, Antigone's stubbornness and says, you are the on air here, not me. It's a really extraordinary moment in Greek uh, with this word that strongly means he-man. And Creon <laughs> says to this little slip of a girl, Antigone, you're the ombre here, uh, not me. Uh, and similarly of Clytemnestra 
in the Oresteia, the woman who murders Agamemnon. She's called an Anea at one point. So I, I, uh, although this is, is a very strong contrast between the masculine and feminine principles, even the ancient Greeks don't confine it to biological males and females. They, you can say in ancient Greek uh, that a woman is an Anea, and <laughs> oh man, if there ever were an ombre, it's Lady Macbeth here. Uh, uh, it's what makes her heroic in her own way. Of course, it puts this enormous strain on her uh, that ultimately uh, she cracks under. Uh, uh, so what I'm getting at here is you can see the great debate between classical and Christian values in the debate over the word man in Macbeth. Uh, uh, Lady Macbeth is speaking up for the classical, Homeric, heroic understanding of man as the he-man, as the hombre, as the on-air. Macbeth, paradoxically it seems, is speaking up for a broader Christian understanding uh, of man as humaneness. He even talks of Christianity as humane statute. Uh, uh, now, what's really fascinating is this exact debate is reprised between Malcolm and Macduff uh, at the end of the play. This is on page uh, 79. Uh, uh, the news has reached Macduff that all his children have been killed. Uh, uh, and Malcolm, uh, who plays Lady Macbeth in the scene, remember, uh, Macduff is the on air. He's the he-man. Uh, he's the remaining thane that's the only one that can beat Macbeth. Macbeth in hand-to-hand -hand combat, not Malcolm. Malcolm had to be rescued in the opening scene. He's right there with his father, Duncan. What bloody, what bloody man is this? Uh, 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 but, but Malcolm knows he needs Macduff here, and so he rouses, he's going to rouse. You know, what a great opportunity. His family's been killed. We're going to get Macduff out on the warpath. Uh, and so he says, line 219, dispute it like a man. I shall do so but I must also feel it as a man. And then an incredible line, I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. One of the great examples of understatement in Shakespeare. Uh, he knows when understatement works. But anyway, dispute it like a man, I shall do so, but I must also feel it as a man. It's the same dispute again. What is, it a, man? What is a man? Is a man simply disputatious? Is it simply one of these contentious he-men on the battlefield? Or is it someone who also allows for feeling? And notice on page 80, uh, McDuff says, oh, I could play the woman with mine eyes, line 230 in this scene, and brag it with my tongue. But now he's going to go and fight McDuff. And Malcolm says, this time goes manly. Now, I, it's uncanny how similar these two dialogues are. They both turn on the issue of what is a man, whether to be a man is to be a heroic warrior, or whether it's to be something more that encompasses feeling and compassion. And both sides have the debate. That's what I want you to see. Uh, that, again, it's very simple to read this play as Macbeth as uniquely evil uh, and, and that uh, he's the only problem in Scotland. But I've been trying to suggest Banquo and, for that matter, uh, Macduff have a lot in common with Macbeth. Uh, it's very similar in the sense that they both are heroic warrior types and they, uh, uh, each one uh, could have been the other. Uh, Banquo's almost seduced by the witches. There's a cool side of Macduff that let his wife and children there to be killed and that he, even he feels uh, uh, guilty uh, uh, about. Uh, and here we, we see it. The, the debate over manliness extends throughout Scotland. It's on both sides. Lady Macbeth uh, and Macbeth have it uh, and uh, uh, Macbeth uh, Macduff and um, um, Malcolm uh, have it. And one of the most interesting reflections of that uh, is uh, the, right at the end, uh, again, one might feel like saying only Macbeth becomes victim to the uh, he-man view uh, of uh, what a man is and therefore he becomes this uh, butcher, this murderer. But in fact, the good party... <laughs> Uh, the English and the good Scottish are the same way. 
Uh, look at page 84. As the army is gathering near Dunsnane, Act 5, Scene 2, uh, line 10, and many unruff youths that even now protest their first of manhood. Oh, these young Sco English and the Scots, they're going to prove their manliness in the battle. Uh, and then the strongest reflection of this, uh, uh, page 96, this again shows you how Shakespeare complicates things. Uh, uh, Act 5, scene 8, line 39, uh, uh, when Seward learns the news of his son. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived but till he was a man which no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought, but like a man he died. And that is like an on air. That's like an hombre. Uh, it's not like a human being he died. He died like a man. That he is dead, Seward asked. Is that the Seward cry? No. Aye, and brought off the field, your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. Ross is inviting him here to weep his heart out. Your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. And what does Seward say? Had he his hurts before, I on the front. In other words, did he die running from battle or going into it? He died going into battle. Why then, God's soldiers be he, had I as many sons as I have heirs, I would not wish them to a fair a death, and so his knell is knolled. Does that remind you of Volumnia back in Coriolanus? Uh, uh, it really, uh, uh, it's that same attitude. Malcolm, he's worth more sorrow and that I'll spend for him. He's worth no more. They say he parted well and paid his score. So it's really, uh, 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 the, the on air view is there among the victors uh, as well. Uh, uh, and of course, it's there in Macbeth's own death. Uh, just quickly to wind up on page 95, uh, 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 Act 5, Scene 8, about line 18, when Macbeth finally learns the solution to this riddle of the Caesarean section, he says, uh, Accursed be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. <laughs> and that's manliness again. That's cojones, that's, that's the hombre. And so Macbeth's last words, and that's where we get Jose Benedetti's article, are uh, line 32, lay on Macduff and damn be him that first cries hold enough. Uh, Macbeth dies re-embracing the heroic principle he began with uh, as a Homeric warrior uh, in the opening uh, scenes. So I end with this, I could end the whole course with this, in the sense that here we see uh, the great debate we've been seeing played out uh, uh, here, the debate between the classical notion of heroic manliness, uh, the aristocratic strength of Coriolanus on fair ground, I could beat 40 of them, and these new Christian notions uh, uh, that put the emphasis uh, on suffering. And I've been raising uh, uh, Machiavelli a lot. Of course, let me return to what I began with from Machiavelli and I think it will round out things for you. This is that passage from page 131, the discourses. You've heard it, I think, twice before, or maybe three times in the course, but I hope that by now it will mean a lot more to you. Thinking then whence it can arise that in those ancient times people were more lovers of freedom than in these, I believe it arises from the same cause that makes men less strong now, which I believe is the difference between our education and the ancient, founded on the difference between our religion and the ancient. For our religion, having shown the truth in the true way, makes us esteem less the honor of the world, whereas the Gentiles, the pagans, esteeming it very much and having placed the highest good in it, were more ferocious in their actions. Besides this, the ancient religion did not beatify men if they were not full of worldly glory as were captains of armies and princes of republics. Our religion, has glorified, our religion has glorified humble and contemplative more than active men. It has then placed the highest good in humility, abjectness, and contempt of things human. The other placed it in greatness of spirit, strength of body, and all other things capable of making men very strong. And if our religion asks that you have strength in yourself, it wishes you to be capable 
capable more of suffering than of doing something strong. This mode of life thus seems to have rendered the world weak and given it in prey to criminal men who can manage it securely, seeing that the collectivity of men, so as to go to paradise, think more of enduring their beatings than of avenging them. And that's the story of Duncan right there, who Duncan in his piety and his clemency and his mercy abandons the world to men like Macbeth. Uh, who rule cruelly. I do cannot prove that Shakespeare knew that passage. He did not need to know that passage. In fact, uh, uh, he was capable of looking at the Renaissance world and seeing this tension between classical uh, and Christian uh, culture himself. I'll end with one line from uh, uh, Macbeth. The most Nietzschean line in all of Shakespeare, the most Nietzschean line before Nietzsche, when, this is page 29, Act 2, Scene 2, Line 45. When Lady Macbeth says to Macbeth, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brainly of things. Uh, I will repeat that so the music doesn't drown it out. You do unbend your noble strength, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things. What an incredible line. Uh, the contrast between noble strength and what Lady Macbeth sees as the brain sickliness uh, of this modern world. So, as I've been trying to show throughout the semester, uh, Shakespeare really does draw upon uh, political issues in his plays. Uh, they give so much more depth to them when we ask these political questions. He is doing something uh, along the lines of what a number of the great political thinkers have done. I've, I brought up Plato and Aristotle and Machiavelli and Nietzsche. I could have brought up others. I hope that Shakespeare uh, sounds more interesting to you when you see him in light of these political ideas. And I hope I've shown that he is a genuine political thinker uh, who in many ways drew upon Plato and Aristotle, and Machiavelli, and anticipated uh, Nietzsche. At the same time, I hope maybe I got you interested in Plato and Aristotle and Machiavelli and Nietzsche. What I'd say about this, uh, uh, maybe the ultimate value of studying Shakespeare in politics is to see that politics is a, a perhaps more elevated subject than uh, uh, election polling data. Uh, you, can, you can do regression analyses on election results uh, all day, but Shakespeare reminds us that politics is a lot more than that. And above all, it involves a conception of what is the good life for human beings. That's why he's so concerned about the debate between the classical and Christian positions uh, on this subject. And he really shows that political questions open up the deepest questions, uh, both about human nature uh, and what's best in human life. So with that, I'll bring this to a close. Now, let's throw things open to questions about the exam, anything else you'd like to, or anything else you'd like to know about. you guys got some questions. <laughs> Give me a long time. <laughs> uh, okay, let me, I'll say a few words about the exam then to help you out with it. Do, for the uh, first part, for the ideas, don't spend too much time on that. Uh, don't, certainly don't spend more than an hour on it. Each ID doesn't count for that much. And give brief answers. Don't try to write a little essay on, uh, on each uh, little passage. Uh, for the uh, essays, uh, follow the instructions. Uh, uh, they each are going to ask you to write about three plays. Just write about three plays. Don't write about four plays. Don't write about two plays. Write about three plays. I have that note there. Uh, we're trying to get, what we don't want is for you to write about the same three plays in one part that you do in the other. Ideally, it'd be nice if you could write about six plays in the uh, two parts. Uh, but um, uh, if, you, if one play fits both your answers, that's going to be no disaster. Uh, just use your judgment on that. But again, your goal should be to uh, show as many as... It, uh, 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 show knowledge of as many plays uh, as you can. Uh, I think that's about the best advice I can give. Yes? How much direct by points do you want to for the essay? 
uh, you don't need to directly, you know, the smart person, uh, you'll have 25 quotes there written out for you. I've noticed over the years, really clever people manage to work some of those quotes in their essays. But I do not expect you to have memorized Shakespeare. In fact, we get a little suspicious if we see, you know, the whole of the to be or not to be speech quoted uh, in an answer. Though one of you may be an actor and played Hamlet, so, so, but... Uh, uh, don't worry about that. We don't expect you to quote uh, 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 lines, uh, you know, uh, to fish out to be or not to be. Probably isn't that difficult. Uh, but uh, we're not going to be judging you by how much Shakespeare you've memorized. Uh, any questions about the final? Because, uh, now, I will be, um, I'm staying here through, <laughs> I'm leaving the... Provide the world doesn't end on the 21st. I'm leaving the 22nd, so I will be here. I won't keep any office hours, but you can always reach me by email, uh, and I'm, uh, I can uh, arrange to speak to any of you if you have any questions. Uh, any questions about Shakespeare left over? Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly, uh, the, uh, I've concentrated on some of the negative things uh, that Christianity, Christianity introduces into political life. But in broader terms of human life, it obviously opens up all sorts of new horizons. And one of those is the interior of the human soul. The characters like Hamlet, Macbeth, and Othello are just deeper uh, than characters like Coriolanus and even Brutus and Julius Caesar and maybe even Antony and Cleopatra, though the whole point I was showing about Antony and Cleopatra is with the dissolution of the ancient world, some of that human interiority begins to open up along lines that are parallel to the development of Christianity. Uh, so uh, again, when in the ancient world, the focus is so much on political life that it narrows people's horizons. Uh, and even the philosophy in the ancient world tends to be politicized. So it's things like Epicureanism and Stoicism, which are doctrines, which are almost like party formulations, which these Romans, like Brutus and Cassius, clearly adapt adopt to their political ends. So that Brutus's stoicism almost seems like a political stance and not a true, uh, a, a true form of philosophy, which would be self-examination. Whereas, uh, you know, what, what you said, uh, uh, the great line in Milton's Paradise Lost, Satan says it, uh, for, for who would lose, uh, though filled with pain, those thoughts that wander through eternity. Uh, and that's what you start to see in Hamlet, Macbeth, and Othello, uh, especially Hamlet, Macbeth, that you see thoughts that wander through eternity, that these eternal vistas has, have opened up, and these, these characters are more thoughtful. I mean, you know, uh, you, again, you can see it in the contrast between Coriolanus's abortive soliloquies and, and Macbeth's genuine self-examinations in his soliloquies. People have begun to think more in this world, and they've begun to think more because uh, the political uh, has lost much of its centrality in human life uh, when you start to speak about an afterlife. Uh, now, as I've shown, that leads to some problems when people try to base a politics on an afterlife, and particularly on the notion uh, that you see in Macbeth of trying to realize the afterlife uh, here in this life. Uh, leads to a tremendous distortion of politics. But still, there's a, a new kind of thoughtfulness. Uh, and uh, certainly in Hamlet, the word philosophy comes up. It's really summed up when uh, Hamlet says to Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in your philosophy. Horatio seems to represent uh, the ancient world, perhaps specifically Stoicism. Uh, and then really is Hamlet talking about just what I'm pointing to here, the, the, the opening up of horizons that 
we first of all, when Ant and Cleopatra said, we, we have to find out new heaven, new earth. Uh, the ancient world, as Shakespeare portrays it in Coriolanus, was so enclosed. Again, as we saw, the city almost has a roof. Uh, it sets narrow horizons for its citizens. It doesn't want them thinking about eternal questions because it wants them in battle. Uh, but, but now in the, uh, this Christian world, which flows out of a critique of politics, tis paltry to be Caesar, saw that in, in Antony Cleopatra, and it's certainly very much at the heart of Hamlet that he has so many doubts about Denmark. Denmark's a prison. Uh, he could be, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself king of infinite space. Uh, uh, that's where the, this, this new interest in the infinite, the eternal, the absolute, these are all, I mean, they are in fact metaphysical terms. And we see the characters have in a way become metaphysical. Uh, even Macbeth, even a guy who's profession is to cut people in half, uh, starts to be thinking about his eternal jewel and the crack of doom and all these things that are much larger questions. Uh, uh, and I mean that, I think Shakespeare sees that as uh, why his world is so much more interesting than the ancient world, even though he, he admired the ancient world and made a huge effort to recreate it on a stage. Uh, uh, now, again, if we, uh, uh, my greatest regret is that we did not do King Lear, uh, which actually features a dialogue between a king and a philosopher in the central scene of its central act. Unfortunately, we do not hear that dialogue, so we'll never know what happened. But, and in Shakespeare's possibly last play, The Tempest, uh, is all about my view of philosopher king. So there's a lot more treatment of philosophy in Shakespeare, oddly enough, in some of the comedies. Again, I regret not having, to, you know, we did the, in some ways the darkest of all the comedies uh, by doing Merchant of Venice. I, I was in New York to do As You Like It, not on the stage, but in a, in a seminar. Uh, and it struck me, I, I was telling a couple of students before we began the guest, I wish we'd done As You Like It, just so you could see there's a light side to Shakespeare. Uh, and, and it's uh, part of his own philosophical disposition that in his comedies, he doesn't take all this politics that seriously. So, other questions? Okay, if I got time here, I'm going to go ahead and end with what my, I was going to end with. This is, I'm going to regret this, but here goes. Uh, just to, You guys are always asking me to relate stuff to contemporary politics. So, December 3rd, 2012. Doesn't get much contemporary more. Uh, I'm still hooked, to, hooked up to my UVA email. I get this email yesterday uh, from the office of Governor Bob McDonald in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, I want to show you that this very debate we've looked at today is, is uh, still going on in our culture, though completely submerged uh, and obliterated in modern polit politics. The dear fellow state employees, I'm a state employee in Virginia, the First Lady and I would like to invite you to the annual Capitol Tree Lighting this Friday, December 7, 2012 at 5 p.m. on the South Portico of the Capitol in Richmond. This year, in addition to the tree lighting, we will recognize and pay tribute to the U.S. military by featuring music by the National Guard's 29th Division Band, hosting veterans from each war, uh, the Revolutionary, and presenting guest speaker Captain Bill Haneke, U.S. Army retired. Captain Haneke is a very severely wounded Vietnam veteran, reputed to be the most severely wounded warrior ever to have survived. I wonder what Corey Lanus would say about that. Uh, we will also have another very special guest that evening, six-year-old Nathan Norman and his family. Nathan is a brave warrior who has battled numerous serious health challenges and taught his family and friends so much through his love, strength, and faith. Nathan displays the same qualities as the soldiers who will also be recognized this evening, bravery and selflessness. To salute Nathan and his passion for those in uniform, emergency response vehicles will line North Drive leading up to the mansion for the tree lighting and open house. 
Now, I've been talking in this course about our culture as a secularization of the Christian reinterpretation of the Roman appropriation of Greek culture. And I can't imagine a better representation of that than this message uh, from my governor, Bob McDonald. First of all, notice he's inviting me to the annual Capitol tree lighting this Friday. It's not a Christmas tree. Of course, it can't be a Christmas tree because... That's not separation of church and state anymore. It can't even be a pagan uh, festival of light ceremony. It's, it's just the capital tree light. And then we bring together the two conceptions of man here, the Anair and the Anthropos. Uh, we got the real army there. And, you know, I, I uh, assume this man, Bill Haneke, was a very brave man and underwent something very horrible. Though notice... Now, and again, in Coriolanus, we saw that the ancient hero prided himself on his wounds. Uh, but it also was the sense that Coriolanus triumphed in those battles in which he got the wounds. Here, there's a kind of transformation going on here where this man, what's his claim to fame? He's the most severely worn, wounded warrior ever to have survived. No sense that he won a battle, uh, or, um, uh, but just that his suffering. And that then links him up with Nathan Norman, the six-year-old, who, again, I assume is a very courageous kid, uh, and I don't know what his health challenges are, but they must be something really horrible uh, and, and moving. And yet Nathan displays the same qualities as the soldiers. Uh, that's the illusion that Shakespeare is concerned about. Uh, the line about, remember, about uh, uh, Henry V, uh, uh, he is as full of valor as of kindness, princely in both. That Shakespeare saw as the hope of the Renaissance, that you could bring together these two uh, understandings of man, these two understandings of what virtue is, and they'd be perfectly harmonious here. And that's the same thing here, the way in which a kind of classical admiration of the military blends together with a very Christian sense uh, of of selflessness and 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 surviving, uh, uh, enduring suffering, uh, just what Machiavelli was talking about in that passage. I read the two notions blend together uh, in this one speech, and I just again it struck me as reading it on email yesterday that this whole uh, debate that Shakespeare is examining, or this whole confluence in our culture of these two, in many respects, antithetical visions of humanity. They're still here. Only we've gotten them confused. Uh, Shakespeare helps us articulate them. Remember, I would have blowed up the town so Christ saved me. I offered you that as Shakespeare's understanding that ordinary people, uh, they don't understand that the components of their culture may be antithetical. That's the point of Shakespearean tragedy, uh, to remind us of that. Uh, that there's something a little complicated about saying Nathan displays the same qualities as the soldiers also be recognized this evening. And it's very nice to say, and it makes you feel good to say that, but is it really true? That's what Shakespeare forces us to ask. Are there people in the world like Macbeth and Coriolanus, who, really, who have valor and courage, and are maybe not so nice, and maybe not compatible with a Christian sense uh, of compassion. So uh, I don't want to disagree with my governor. Uh, I don't want to get myself into trouble, although secretly I'm hoping to be banished from Virginia by these remarks, and I've noticed Harvard has a program for persecuted scholars, and maybe I, maybe I can be brought back with some Tibetan uh, because I'm no longer um, I'm persona non grata in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I know you guys want to see things related to the contemporary, and it doesn't get any more contemporary uh, than that. And I hope it does help you grasp that we have an incredibly complicated culture, and above all, this strange confluence uh, of classical and Christian values, which Shakespeare, I think, intuited already in the Renaissance how basic this was 
uh, to our civilization and you wanted to help us articulate. That's why, again, if we, un if we um, uh, change the order that I presented these plays, you can see that he was driving to the point where after Macbeth, he went back to write Coriolanus to study the Anair in his proper setting and then wrote Antony and Cleopatra to show how you get from this classical understanding to the Christian understanding. So with that, I really do bring things to a close. And good luck on the exam. I promise you it's not going to be anything trying to trip you up. Uh, and I'll be available for questions about it between now and then. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's been a great semester for me. I haven't enjoyed teaching a class like this uh, for decades. <laughs>